Hi, I'm Dave Tott. Most of you know me through the Buffer Bloat and Sarawart and Make Wi-Fi Fast projects. How many here use Wi-Fi? Yeah. Uh, Shked Cake was our latest effort that landed in the Linux kernel in 4.19. And once that was done, I got involved in doing something completely different. But it's not as well known I do in other stuff. I'm really proud to say, in particular, um, that the ARCID 6 spacecraft successfully flew last year. I'm not so happy I can't talk about it that much, but it was nice. And uh, I also play guitar. <laughs> so, and the buffer blow work. And the current work I'm doing today, which I'm going to talk about, this is my copy of the internet. Sorry? With porn? With porn? Oh, no, I usually use a piece stick for that. <laughs> so I wanted to start off by asking the room, how many of you think the IPv6 deployment is going well? <laughs> <laughs> About, I've worked very hard on IPv6. I've worked in the Sarah Work Project, like I said, and worked on a whole bunch of RSCs, internet drafts. And a couple of years ago, I felt that we were going to be running into some more difficulty. And uh, John Gilmore, who uh, founded the EFF, came to me and said, you have to see this data. And I looked that over, and I had a revelatory moment. It's not every day that happens, and I would strongly recommend that everyone was, oh, no, you're dead, and that was good. There we go, sorry. And I, uh, I saw some of the graphs in this particular paper that I'm citing here, and I had a, uh, I had a bad moment. And for the last six months, I've been trying to with a small team trying to come up with some ideas for uh, this. Does anyone here agree with this statement? Legacy IPv4 will exist with IPv6 indefinitely. How about just for 10 years? Who here believes that IPv6 will replace IPv4 in 10 years? 20. Who here has no opinion? Raise your hand. <laughs> So I just tried to flick the slide, and nothing happened, guys. How is this supposed to be? The green button. Green button. Oh, there we go. Even if they've deployed IPv6, and this is the really fundamental insight from this paper, growing networks must continue to acquire scarce and increasingly expensive IPv4 addresses to interconnect with the rest of the internet. Until you reach 100% deployment of IPv6, it's very difficult to coexist with IPv4. So, unicast addressing one for IPv4. We tried multicast and it didn't work all that well. A large percentage of the traffic is globally, lo globally routed unicast. And global unicast addresses are the ones we run out of. And everything else we don't care about, really. And right now, there's a nascent uh, IPv4 address market. You can go and get a slash 24 if you want. It's sort of like, hey, buddy, you got an IP address? <laughs> How much you want for that? <laughs> and, uh, but it is evolving, and it's there. Um, and people like myself care. Innovators need addresses. The big incumbents are out there buying up everyone they can find in the existing market there is. And... Uh, I'm always perpetually running startups, and it's nice to be able to interoperate. It's okay if we all want internet innovation to stop. So speculators say, buy land. They ain't buying it, making any more of it. But we can make more IPv4 addresses. It's not hard. It's just a few patches, spec change, and in five to seven years to deploy. So, a bunch of tech geeks got together, noticed what was going on, and I wanted to stress that this is entirely a moonshot talk. It's not a Linux issue, it's not a BSD issue, it's a Windows issue, it's a protocol issue with technical and political aspects. So John Gilmore, who is known to many of you for many reasons, was the original author of BootP and DHCP. And then he went on to do other things. Paul Waters, who can't talk anymore, uh, there he is in the room, 
Uh, I was going to share a talk, but he's too sick to talk. We have a recent addition, Rodney Grimes from FreeBSD, here with us today. And, uh, and then there's me, and I've already mentioned my stuff. And we believe in running code and rough consensus. Oops, what happened there? So the internet isn't finished. It's a success disaster. Uh, it arose from the contributions of many people over time, and there was no grand plan. Does anyone here think there was a grand plan? Cool, I'm glad I'm unified on that one. There's no deities. The internet's more than the World Wide Web. I don't think anything, these things are controversial. And uh, the internet is not finished. There is much yet to be created. And it's a wonderful talk by uh, Karl Arbach. So, but we do have to understand some of the history behind how we got to where we were today with IPv4. We started off with the concept of a class A, a class B, and a class C address. How many people remember those? <laughs> and uh, 08 was find my network number. IP was designed before Ethernet existed, and it turned out that uh, Ethernet had, was too big to squeeze into even a class A. So the zero idea died. And, uh, came back, was retired in 89, and fixed. Similarly, 224 um, slash 4 was reserved for multicast, and a massive amount of enthusiasm for the idea in the early 80s. I'm just curious, how many people know how many multicast addresses are in use today as multicast? OK, 240 was reserved for experimental use, and no experiment ever happened. It turned out by the mid early 90s that class A, B, and C didn't fit real networks, and then we replaced it with a company called CIDR, which uh, was in 92, 93, 94, and that took years and years to deploy. And uh, 224, mm, I'm not going to talk about that yet. So one of the things we worked at proposing with actual patches and running code was a small specification change to IPv4. A couple small patches to kernels and user spaces and configs and routers. A bunch of test beds, which you have up and running today. And we iterate until we have running code and proof of concept that made sense. And then only tackle the politics. I've had enough politics for one month, let me tell you. So running code, consensus first, screwed the last attempt at trying to make 240 globally usable 10 years ago. Uh, I don't know. I don't see any future use for any of these IP addresses we're using. Does anybody have a future use for uh, multicast at, at large scale with over 128 million addresses reserved for nothing? Raise your hands. So we still have a use for multicast on that scale. Good. I'm glad we agree on that one. And uh, zero is pretty cool. So far as I know, it, I, you know, I'll get to that. Anyway, we also had some more controversial proposals that we wanted to run by people after doing a bunch more tests. Um, 127 has, a two, has, a hundred, bleh, has 16 million addresses reserved for it. How many do you think are in use? Well, it's more than that. It's more than one, but it seems to be less than four. <laughs> 16 million addresses, totally unused. And uh, let's make a unicast. Let's use them for something. Similarly, the multicast problem, um, even though multicast has a huge allocation set aside, 128 million were reserved for future use and never allocated. OK. Um, here is what it takes, most of what it takes, to make zero work, 16 million addresses today. Arguably, we should rename the function to something, and that involves touching 22 files, but that's all we need to make it work in Linux today. There's some other minor spec changes. I know that the address thing is kind of controversial, or I thought it would be, walking in the door. Um, but the zeroth address got reserved for broadcast um, back then. And then we fixed that. BSD, when BSD 4.3 rolled out, we didn't need zero anymore. And little traces of that and, and classful routing exist in all the code in the world. That should probably get cleaned up. I uh, don't want to talk about that. I'll just move on. So we're here with some test codes and stuff in the cloud and setups and so on that we're going to talk about over the course of the week and at the coming IETF in terms of technical feasibility as much as we can. One piece of news that some of you may not have is AWS already permits 
use of all the addresses in the reserved address range for any purpose you want. I'm pretty sure several people in the room know where else these addresses are currently being used. Anyway, together with some new ideas and some work, I think we can take some of the previously reserved address ranges and make them into usable and globally routable IPs. Thank you very much. Questions? Hey, Dave. Um, OK, so the basic th thesis here is there's a bunch of IP address space. Can't hear you. you can hear it? Is that on? Yeah. Is it on? Um, so the basic thesis is there's a bunch of IPv4 addresses that are reserved that you want to free up and use. Yes. So given that these addresses have never been used, the obvious question is, if I start to use these in the internet, will they actually pass through the internet? So that seems to me, seems to, me to be the big blocker here. Um, yeah, they're IP, IP addresses, but what if somebody says, oh, this is multicast, and they toss it on the floor automatically? So that's going to be the big thing, is, is whether or not these are actually deployable. And what we want to avoid is getting into another rollout of IPv6, where, oh, this is going to fix IPv6, but then that ends up taking as long as IPv6 to get deployed. So we don't want another IPv10, for instance. Yeah. Well, overall, we are, we are keeping a website up that's taking bug reports and statements like that in the hope that we continue to work forward. Um, I, can, I was hoping for a line of people with pitchforks coming at me at the microphone, but I can take some well, time. What you're saying is kind of obvious, right? There's more address <laughs> space that we could free up. Yes. Um, the deployment problem is very difficult, yes. I don't think you're going to have much argument that IPv4 isn't going away. I mean, there was an article just the other week that basically gave a very uh, gloomy picture of yep. IPv6. So that, probably, that argument probably you're not going to see. It's just, is it deployable is a real question. So handling the deployability argument, two things. One is, if we can make this work, there's obvious demand for more IPv4, yes? So I have actually believe that if we make this stuff work, that will actually create demand for new operating systems that do IPv6 better, and we can handle the curve on both sides better. Okay, and the other, other point, nothing that we've described is anything less than a five to seven year plan. <laughs> um, but as I talked about earlier, it looks like we may well be stuck with IPv4 for a very long time and doing stuff to clean up CIDR and clean up IPv4 and make it as usable as possible strikes me as a good idea. Um, so in terms of implementation, this was just a small patch to get this to work in Linux? Uh, I have, the patches are up on the website. Uh, they are, Four very small patches. I'd intended to submit them as RFCs for this talk. Uh, they have been thoroughly tested. We also have patches for FreeBSD and OpenWRT and so on. Have you posted the patches to NetDev? Uh, not yet, no. Probably be. I probably would nice be good idea. for you review. Might get some other comments. Again, there. I was expecting the pitch for brigade to come out, and all of you are going, "Yes, this is good. This might be good." Okay, so I'll try to get them posted later, and so on. Hi, Mirja. So, sorry, um, I'm Paul Wouter, so I'll, I'll try to just say a few lines because my voice is gone. Um, but um, so uh, we, we, we did a, a grab over all of the software in Fedora, and we found that of the 4,400 packages, there are only like 85 that are actually specifically using the macros from IN.h that are talking about the, the bad class or the in multicast or the in loopback um, uh, modes. And so um, that's a very small percentage. I think from a software point of view, we're actually really good. There is not much change that needs to happen. But of course, from the routing point of view, and I know Dave has worked on some routers as well, so maybe you can say a bit more about the router uh, uh, stuff I, you did? Uh, I do have a member of, of a group here that might want to speak. Would you like to talk about the routing question, Alistair? Well, uh, no, I don't think we're qualified to talk about um, the heart. So, so the issue, I think, boils down into two things, right? There's the software routing stuff, which um, I think the FRR and some of the other projects has dealt with. But the real question is, has anybody implemented stuff in silicon and in hardware? So I think the answer to that is unknown, right? I and agree, the answer is unknown in, in hardware, but in software, we have, this, we have patches for FRR and Bird outstanding already. So, right, so I, I don't think that's gonna be an issue, but the real issue is, is deployed silicon that's out there. 
and and any of the legacy hardware that you're not going to be able to get software updated. So you can either look at this as a bug or a feature, right? Depending on whether you're a vendor and trying to you know, you know churn hardware or whether you're an operator who doesn't want to deal with legacy equipment. But uh, okay. back to your point, it's a seven-year project. So sure. Um, so I would like to disagree on a high-level point here. So I agree that IPv6 will not, uh, IPv4 will not go away. It will stay there for a long time. If you have a system running on IPv4, it's running nicely. Why should you change it, right? Um, but I don't think that like trying to get the rest of the IP addresses in work does solve any problem, because it would just delay the point where we're out of IP addresses a little bit later, like another five to seven years. But then you have the same problem again. So I, I, I disagree that there is a need for more IPv4 addresses. I think the reason why people think they need an IPv4 address is because there is a perceived difference between IPv4 and IPv6. And to get and to get to the point where people can actually use IPv6 as a replacement for, for IPv4, we should put our efforts in making IPv6 working better and make people n n taking away the need for new IPv4 addresses by making it work on IPv6 nicely. That's a very common argument. I'm curious how many people in this room agree with that argument? Absolutely. I totally agree with that. That's good. Roughly two-thirds of the room agrees with you today. And I'm cool with that. I agreed with you until I saw these charts about the actual deployment pace and the fact that it's hit a plateau. So I would recommend everyone that believes in that argument to read what I cited on this thing and try to argue with that rather than me. Thank you very much. I'd like to go to lunch now. How about everybody else? Any more questions? There's one, two, three. Okay, let's do it. Ah. Uh, hello, I'm Marek from Clouster. Uh, I have two points. So first, we did very similar work on getting 1.1.1 working. So it is painful to get the uh, previously uh, yeah, weird IP addresses working. And the second thing is uh, I can't argue for the whole internet, but on the attack side, we do see uh, very, very often very weird ranges attacking us, like 1.7. Yes. or the multicast one. So it's definitely not like blocked all around the internet. They are definitely route hacked. That was actually one of the encouraging pieces of data we had. Being that we could actually trace route to 240 uh, dot whatever slash uh, four from many devices that hadn't implemented BCP 38. They wandered around and they hit a border router. Next. There's two more people. Yeah, we should be able to leverage that experience with 1.1.1 with rolling out these additional ranges. Um, 240 slash 4 is an enormous address space, and I think that that is, is past time that we try to free that up. Next. I'm sorry, I'm a little deaf, so. I... And this was a moonshot talk, just remember. Anyway, good? Thank you very much. Let's go to lunch. <laughs>